Super exciting. Uh, I know it's, we're getting towards the end of the second day. People are getting a little tired, but hopefully this will, this will brighten you up. If you haven't already, there's also some energy drinks out there to keep you going throughout the night because there's, there's a lot going on. Um, if you haven't already, there's the Discord here. You can put your questions in and we can address that throughout the panel. And then we're also gonna try to make it more interactive, engaging. So we'll sort of bring the mics around. We'll let you also agree or disagree with some of the questions we're gonna ask. So the, the goal is for it to be a debate. So we want to hear both sides of the story and um, hear from the audience as well, your questions, your feedback, and uh, potentially bring some of you on stage. So that's, that's the goal. Um, we're going to be talking about, is the metaverse dead? So a lot of exciting questions and, and, and pieces of it to get into. Um, but yeah, with that, I'm Ashton, cashton.eth.lens. I work for a company called Flight3, um, previously Zebra Digital, recently got acquired um, by a company called Flight Story. So we help sort of Web2 brands get into Web3 and also Web3 startups to grow and scale. Um, I'm really excited to be hosting this panel. It's the, the third debate, so hopefully got some, some practice already. <laughs> so it's not as bad. I'm kidding. Um, but yeah, thanks everyone for joining. And uh, let's get ready to debate. Woo, 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 woo. Give it up. Woo! <laughs> All right. And in, uh, and in this corner, <laughs> we have t Bolts from Exclusible. Just go ahead and introduce yourself to the crowd and let's get it going. Hello everyone. Uh, thank you for being here because uh, still 10 minutes ago the room was totally empty, so we were getting a bit uh, a bit nervous, but uh, happy to be here. So I'm the CEO of uh, Exclusible, and at Exclusible we develop NFT project and uh, metaverse project uh, for brands with a strong focus on uh, luxury brand and fashion brands. Let's give it up for Gigi Bolt. Woo! <laughs> there we go. And now I'm going to give it up to, I'm going to go with Paul from Ben Builders. Yes. Hello, everybody. Very happy to be with you today. So my name is uh, Paul Mugino. I'm one of the co-founders of uh, Ben Builders in charge of uh, technology. Uh, originally, my background is uh, very much in uh, artificial intelligence. In the past, I created an uh, AI company back in 2016 that was acquired by a Vente Privé Group, uh, where I later created the, the whole pricing uh, department. And uh, now, uh, uh, with the team, we have a strong belief uh, in the metaverse and very happy to, to present you uh, some insight today uh, together with this uh, amazing uh, attendance. Love it. Give it up for Paul, everybody. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> All right, now, uh, George, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself from Hello. Voxel Architects. Sure. Hello, everyone. I'm George Bileka. I'm very happy to be here in Lisbon um, with all of you. I'm the leader of Voxel Architects. We've been building and designing in the metaverse for the past three years and a half, counting to four this year. Uh, we strongly believe that the metaverse will play a major role in the future. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to host this panel. Thank you, everyone, for having me. Yeah, give it up. <laughs> There we go. Love that engagement. Keep it up. Um, so we're going to start with a, a little bit of an explainer. Um, what is the metaverse for those that don't know or those that are a little confused about the full definition of, of what it is and how it, how it scopes? Can I start? Yeah. I think that people got a little bit confused in the past and there have been multiple definitions of the metaverse. The truth is that, uh, you know, there are still some questions around it, like what really is the metaverse? You know, we all imagine this utopian or slash dystopian scenario where the metaverse is essentially this one singular platform where we escape from our da daily lives into a alternate universe, right? Um, but the reality is a little bit different. Uh, what we define as the metaverse right now is actually the next generation of the internet, which has a 3D layer uh, attached to it. So the way that we interact with internet right now, it's about to change, and it's about to add more interactivity to the things that we are already doing. Yes. Go ahead, uh, you want to add on it? So at Ben Builders, we create, uh, just like you, uh, experiences in uh, the metaverse uh, for brands and companies, and for us, it's uh, pragmatically a medium. And this medium has features that are uh, a bit similar to some uh, in the physical world. For instance, uh, when you ha are in a virtual world, you're kind of captive, just like in an airport, so it's uh, easier to uh, expose elements of the brand that you want to show uh, in a longer time frame. Uh, so for instance, uh, we could see that, for instance, when we created uh, an experience for Carrefour uh, a few weeks ago, uh, we saw that uh, a few uh, 
dozen thousand visitors stayed an average of 56 minutes. So uh, it's much longer than the average uh, time span you have on uh, TikTok or uh, social networks. Uh, it also has some uh, uh, interesting um, uh, features beyond uh, the airport aspect um, to, to you know, uh, show elements of the brands that you can't normally show, just like uh, uh, an attraction park but virtual, so you can be free of some constraints and at the same time you, can, you have the possibility of renewing the experience. So many interesting features and at the same time you can embed new technologies, maybe we'll talk a little bit about uh, AI or generative elements to create a fascinating experience. So that's, what, that's a mix of technology, of course you have 3D, of, of course you have collaborative elements, but from a very pragmatic standpoint it's a new medium that brand can use to uh, expose more content to their audience. And Anything to change with that definition? <laughs> yeah, so in my opinion, the, the metaverse is not a space, right? Many people ask me, okay, is uh, Roblox metaverse, is uh, Sandbox metaverse, what is the metaverse? So for us, metaverse is a moment. It's a moment when your digital presence is as important as your physical presence. So probably many of you, you probably think you have nothing to do with the metaverse, but in my own definition, and especially more with remote working, I'm sure many of you spend four to seven hours a day on your phone, you work from home, you spend your time on, on Zoom meetings. So for me, this is really the beginning of the metaverse, right? So with those definitions, is the metaverse truly dead? Agree or disagree? How do we feel going into this discussion? Okay, majority of no, the metaverse is not dead. Okay, that's good. We have a yes, though. There's one yes, well yes. done. Interested to hear, hear from that yes, perspective. we want to hear. <laughs> do you guys, you guys all say no, right? Are we yeah, even I'm arguing good. about this? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to give your yes perspective? <laughs> Do you want to come up here? <laughs> yeah, bring it up. Woo. All right, so the reason I say yes is the idea of getting people to actually start adopting it. While there are all of these new technologies emerging and there are pretty interesting use cases that are possible with it, in order for it to not be considered dead, it has to be really used by everyday consumers. And that's just not something that we're seeing going on widespread enough. And a lot of people, when they look at Metaverse, based on what they hear about Metaverse, they see it as something that is relatively stupid and they don't understand the appeal of it. So that is why I label it as dead. It's just not getting the outreach it needs to be in a space where I would count it as being live. Do you want to introduce yourself for the crowd as well? Uh, yeah, my name is Jacob Hap. I'm based out of Berlin, Germany, and I'm the CEO of Anomaly Science. It is a company that is in producing tokenized software licenses and in decentralized content resolution. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Appreciate the perspective. Now, I want to hear from, from our panelists. What, what do you say to that? Yeah, well, I'm going to start. Well, I don't think the metaverse is dead because, first and foremost, it didn't even have the chance to exist. So, in the past, it was vastly used as a marketing term to promote products that were not necessarily related to what the metaverse actually is. And if some of you read Neil Stevenson's book, Snow Crash, or uh, you saw Cyberpunk or Ready Player One, the movie, in all of these scenarios, the metaverse is this alternate universe that where people can basically live an alternative life, right? And we don't have this type of interactions yet. What we did was only to add a three-dimensional layer to what we were already doing on the internet. It's just a taste of what the metaverse could be, you know? Uh, we are, you know, as a species, and I'm going in a, in a very deep, uh, you know, um, Let's get deep, debate. go for it. Yeah. Uh, we as a species, we are becoming not only, let's say, uh, multi-planetary species, thanks to the efforts of SpaceX and Na NASA, but we also strive to become an interdimensional species, right? And the metaverse, it's what is going to propel ourselves to become a multidimensional species, right? And in order to do that, we need to figure out what makes our reality reality and convert it into a digital reality. So I don't think that it had a chance to exist. And I think we only got to experience the 3D layer that, you know, sits at the base of what it, it could potentially become in the future. That is deep. I love it. <laughs> Next dimension. Yes, in my opinion, it really depends on the definition, right? If, if Metaverse is buying your land and believe you will be millionaires, yes, for sure, uh, it's dead. And maybe actually the word Metaverse is dead. If you look at uh, the Apple uh, keynote of this week, right? They didn't pronounce a single word the term metaverse, right? So it depends if 
if augmented reality, virtual reality, you include in metaverse, is clearly not dead, right? So many brands actually contact us and they want to do metaverse, but they say, look, let's do it, but we will call it differently, right? We don't use the word metaverse. You can call it gaming and do something in Roblox. You can call it immersive experience, virtual world, uh, uh, microverse or whatever. So th they don't want to use the term metaverse, but basically it's just, it's just digitalization and, and people spend more and more time online. So, I mean, it's natural that if people spend half of their day on their computer and on their phone, there will be more and more uh, immersive experience. Yeah, I totally second that. I understand uh, your, your vision and uh, what you say. And uh, uh, it's true that actually now what we see with our clients is that most of the metaverse applications uh, reside in marketing. And uh, it's often a better way to connect with your client base or reactivate uh, parts of your client base that you have usually uh, trouble getting in touch with. So as such, it's already uh, well working uh, because uh, uh, you mentioned that there was, there was not a lot of visitors. It's actually not uh, totally true because if you take into account like uh, Roblox, Fortnite, uh, Zepeto, etc., numbers, I think you reach uh, half a billion uh, visitors every month. So it's a lot of volume. Uh, these people often, especially for Roblox, they're between 11 and 16 years old. So it's the consumers of tomorrow. And uh, you want to create a relevant uh, experience for them that is uh, safe, interesting, engaging, etc. Uh, there is also another macro trend that you mentioned with uh, Apple, which is uh, what I call uh, ambient internet. So the idea that uh, maybe uh, we won't wear uh, like connected uh, headset all the time or whatever, but uh, in the future we can expect that uh, we will be less in front of screens and rather, uh, uh, you know, uh, having some side indication on the road we have to take or the information we get. And uh, maybe this is what we should embed in the metaverse definition and also when we work with clients, it is something we need to integrate. And the last thing I have to say is that the metaverse indeed is absolutely not dead because we haven't even touched the surface of what we do. And when we create an experience, it's a lot of, um, uh, you know, body of works that you have to assemble from game design, storytelling, etc. And we haven't even scratched the surface of creating, for instance, digital twins. And if you think about it, when you're a creator, uh, you work in 3D, you need to collaborate with people around the world. Uh, there, there is still not a lot of relevant tools you can use to, to create something meaningful. Uh, in industries, of course, now you have big investment from NVIDIA and other companies to create digital twins of factories, but you still don't have a full uh, uh, array of suppliers that can help you when you're a small uh, le leatherware company, you want to create a, a digital twin of uh, assembly line to check if you should change something or not. So there will be a lot of needs for this in a, in a close future, and at least that's our thesis when we created uh, Pen Builders. Do you, do you agree with them? Do you still think that the metaverse is dead based on that? So I would still say for now, I think it is dead, but I do believe that it has the ability to come alive as it gains more traction. And one thing that you said that I'm more really interested in, I'm gonna take a seat after this, that way other people can participate, is you mentioned uh, the idea of like games like Roblox and Fortnite being early ideas of the metaverse. Where would you consider the division between what most people consider metaverse and what most people consider traditional gaming and where the overlap is and how this will eventually morph into what we currently see as the internet and the web today? Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Happy to go from there. Great questions, appreciate it, yeah, and great perspective. If, if I may just, uh, you know, he, he ended up on a, on a great note there. Like, where, what is the intersection of, you know, gaming and the metaverse? Like, where does it start? Where does it end? In my opinion, I think the metaverse in itself should have a very solid economy and should allow people to basically live and thrive in this virtual world just as well as they do in the real one. So I would say while, you know, those are still games, uh, it's not, let's say, the real metaverse that we all aspire to have, right? So, uh, you know, there, those are just the building blocks. It's slowly coming together and eventually we're gonna figure it out. But until then, I think there's gonna be a very long road, uh, both from a hardware, software, and conceptual perspective until we reach that point. So we've kind of started with games, but that's not the end goal, right, of the metaverse. Exactly. Any perspective For me, that? what is interesting with game now is that it become an economy, right? If you look, I think Roblox last year, the economy inside the game was $750 million, right? So you have people actually having their business, right? Uh, in, inside the game, 
you can build something, you have a lot of creators you can buy, you can sell like you would do in real life. Uh, and I guess this is, is going in the direction of metaverse, right? When me, I can create whatever I want, I can invite people, I can sell something, organize an event or whatever. This is, in my definition, metaverse, even if some people would argue, no, you don't, it's not decentralized, uh, you don't really own, uh, you know. But, yeah, this is uh, my vision of the metaverse. Are there any real use cases outside of gaming for the metaverse? What do people feel? Agree or disagree? Any use cases outside of gaming at the moment? Okay, yeah. Let's hear about some of those use cases. What do you guys think? What are the biggest use cases for the metaverse? You mentioned marketing, of course, but obviously past that. Yes, absolutely. Uh, marketing is a use case. It's uh, actually from an entrepreneurship standpoint, it's very interesting because marketing budgets are often in a company the most easily available budgets when you create a company. Uh, as you know, in the past, I created uh, tech companies and I was targeting uh, tech clients, you know, tech departments, etc. And uh, the sales cycle, even if sometimes the prices are very high, it's often 12 to 18 months. When you work with marketing people, you can activate, I'm not saying it's easier, but you can activate easier, more easily a, a campaign and see if it's working or not. So marketing is very interesting use case. And uh, what we are trying to do uh, at BEM Builders is experiment uh, kind of um, web three fundamental culture element when we create a marketing campaign. So to give, uh, for instance, an example, we try to understand what could mean the world interoperability when it comes to metaverse. So we don't have a definite answer, but for us it's very important. And one example we did recently, for instance, with Orange was a, a multi-metaverse uh, campaign against uh, cyberbullying. Uh, where we had uh, some, we reactivated the historical phone booth that we had uh, in many countries uh, in the past, and we sent them into many metaverses, and it was a possibility for the players that were uh, potentially harassed. It's actually half of the players in uh, universities like this that are often harassed. They had a line for, with uh, somebody to get help, and it uh, raised a lot of interest. So again, it's marketing, but every time we try to be creative and add a new layer, and I'm sure you have uh, other examples as well. So it's a first use case. What do you think, George? Yeah, I think there are many use cases for the metaverse. And we have you know, tried to tackle multiple use cases, like aside from marketing, we have you know, digital shopping, real estate, uh, three-dimensional websites in general. Uh, we have education, which is going to benefit massively from the metaverse, let's say. Even this pavilion, you know, it can be recreated in the metaverse and probably in 100 years is going to be preserved fully in a digital realm. Uh, who knows, you know, what could happen. And you could also, um, you know, recreate historical sites like, for example, like Pompeii or um, Rome and explore, you know, what, what has happened hundreds of years ago. So I think uh, the metaverse has a lot of use cases. Uh, it's very hard to outline all of them right now, um, but at least these are three of the use cases that come from the top of my head. Yes, there's a few use cases. I mean, uh, events, uh, e-commerce, uh, internal metaverse for uh, training and education. So maybe I can give a couple of examples, right? So events, we did uh, Fashion Week. We will do in June a Beauty Week. We did the concert of uh, Bob Sinclair. Uh, but sometimes you can mix, for example, for Hugo Boss during the Fashion Week, we did an experience, but inside this experience, you can buy product, right? So it's a mix between an event and e-commerce. Uh, and also we see more and more demands from, let's say in the, in the brand, you have two kinds of clients. Your clients can be the marketing department or it can be the human resources department, right? So for the human resources, they want to do some kind of training because they realize that People learn faster and remember better if there's some kind of gamification, if it's fun. Uh, and also, uh, with um, everything related to sustain sustainability, when you're a big group, right, and you cannot, I don't know, your group in New York, you have people all, all over the world, instead of getting flight ticket and hotel for everyone, you say, you know what, let's try to do an event or a training, immersive, where the employee will engage, they will have to watch a video, reply to a few questions, and this kind of thing. We, we often have the question, like when you're a luxury firm, why, why should we uh, have people putting headsets or uh, getting on 
metaverses like on screen, etc. And again, if we go back to uh, one of the defini poten potential definition, which is it's a new medium. When you imagine if you are a high jewelry company, something you can do in this type of universe that you can't really do in another way is that imagine you could like really inflate the size of your uh, jewelry that is often small and you can enable people to navigate inside, you know, in especially inside the, the jewelry, see the details, the shape, etc., and enable another way to discover the collection. And you can't really do it in video because you can't move the way you want. You can't really do it with photos because it's not animated image. And it's just an example, you know, the creativity is without limit. It's not like breakthrough and crazy, but it's a very nice complement, especially if it's a capsule, if it's a temporary moment uh, to people uh, for this to discover like this and it's uh, resonating with fashion week and i second totally the the training aspect also uh, which will be in my opinion very important also uh, on industrial and factory applications yeah to, to add a little bit on that because i completely agree w with what you said so now we see more and more vr headsets being released um and we see that you know apple has released a new headset right now and it has very similar application to what we can see on our phone, right? But my question to you, to the whole public is, why would you want to put on a headset, a VR headset, get immersed in a virtual world and navigate a two-dimensional website? So the real use case of VR headsets is actually this transition to a fully immersive three-dimensional world. So this could be one of the biggest leaps for the metaverse, the development of VR headsets, more affordable, uh, the development of the new Apple headset. So I think we are going in a direction where we are going to completely change the way we navigate the internet. And this is what we are personally working on right now. Yeah, it's a big topic to get into. And there's, and there's so many interesting topics with the metaverse that we can get into. I think the Apple VR headset obviously is one of the most recent and, and biggest announcements. Who's already heard of, of the headset that Apple's released? Yeah, pretty much everyone. Um, so yeah, they, they released it earlier this week, and it's $3,400. Uh, who, who's who's going to buy an Apple headset in this room? Okay, maybe maybe half and half. Okay, that's interesting. It's quite expensive, of course, um, compared to some of the price points, like $500 for a headset. Um, do we believe that this Apple headset has revived the metaverse fundamentally? Agree or disagree? <laughs> okay, yeah, about half and half. Interesting. Okay, let's get let's get two perspectives on the Apple headset. Has it revived the metaverse or has it not? Uh, in my opinion, it's not uh, even a headset, it's a computer. Uh, you have a computer uh, embedded in this uh, it's a device. I think uh, from a technological standpoint, it's very excited, exciting because it's one of the most uh, sophisticated uh, public devices we, we ever created. Uh, I mean, that is publicly available at least. And um, it's very interesting because uh, uh, I don't know if many of you experienced uh, what is a spatial, like virtual reality, in the sense that the image you see is calculated depending on your position in the space, which is again a bit different from a VR headset. But there is only a few experiences in the world uh, where you can do it, uh, you know, as a uh, like a museum or whatever. In France, we have something called. Um, uh, Eternel Notre Dame, which is a place where you can see like Notre Dame de Paris that was built uh, and uh, have this experience and uh, what you see is calculated depending on what you look at at a certain point, etc. And you wear a computer, but it's a big computer. Now you have everything in your headset. So I'm very uh, prudent in the, in the feedback because I think only a few people in the world have experienced what it is to wear this type of headset. Again, it's very different from VR. So I'm just uh, very waiting and I want to test and the whole team is uh, in the starting blocks to start creating uh, experience in this. Completely agree with that, uh, you know, with that standpoint. I think what Apple has offered us, it's basically a transitional device to what we could potentially experience, right? We don't, you know, we, I think that VR was way ahead of its time when it was initially released, and I still think it is, because a lot of people don't get used to it, like a lot of people get dizzy uh, wearing a VR headset. Uh, not too many people have figured it out how to use it. So what Apple has offered us is basically this way of, this new way of interacting with the normal apps that you use on your phone on a headset. But this thing is gonna slowly transition into a full three-dimensional experience in the future. But we need to go through this transitional period. I think it's very important. 
for me, when I started to build in the metaverse or in one of the metaverse platforms, I basically did a design of a building that was similar to something in real life. Why? Because I wanted it to be relatable to people. I wanted people to understand how to navigate it before I jumped head on and created crazy experiences. So I think what Apple is offering us, it's just a device that is gonna propel the future of the metaverse. Yes, and in my opinion, first of all, they will. They did not use and they will not use at all the term metaverse, right? So I don't think it will have a big impact on the virtual world. Like, I don't think more brands will contact us to build something in Decentraland or Sandbox. But I think what will happen is that many brands will want to create more immersive experience. You know, you're a fashion brand, you have a shop, and you say, okay, I want to create an immersive experience with augmented reality or virtual reality in my shop, in my museum, in my university, or, or or whatever, so yeah, we go in the direction of a more immersive world, but I'm not sure we'll have a big impact on virtual world. What I thought when I saw this uh, announcement is that it will create probably new jobs uh, that are extremely hybrid and there is nothing right now in schools or whatever to train for this job. For instance, if you think about UX design, right now UX design is very much in, uh, in two dimensions, but to do it in a virtual headset and have a pleasant experience, maybe you will need to mix it with uh, maybe neuroscience or architecture, so have uh, very hybrid profiles. and. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm French, uh, just like uh, Thibaut, and I really wonder how it can, uh, how, how the system can adapt, you know, to create this type of very hybrid uh, profiles jumping between uh, topics, because it's going to be very important, in my opinion. Yeah, so I think what a lot of what we're getting, obviously, with, with the metaverse and with this new headset and everything, is the ability to immerse yourself and connect in a deeper way outside of just the physical world. And so, one thing that I've, I've seen or, or wondered is like, is this the right way for a community to go? Or is this gonna be good for consumers, for children, for people that are gonna be using this headset for who knows how many hours a day? How do we feel about that piece of the topic? Yeah, I think this is a tough question, you know? Uh, because it it's, it's basically about like predicting, predicting the future, is this gonna be good? Well, probably it's gonna aid a lot of people, especially people with, for example, visual impairments. So this would be, this could probably be a lifesaver for, for some people. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, like it will help people understand better how a virtual headset will work and how it can in enhance their daily lives. Um, but uh, no, I, I, think, I think it's gonna, it's gonna have a big, a big impact on, on society overall. The only thing that I was thinking about is the fact that the headset is still quite big, so we need to get used to, let's say, you know when phones appeared, you had like the huge Motorola phones that had like a huge antenna to attached to them, and now we have this v virtual headset that has like a huge cable attached to it, and then you put it in your pocket to <laughs> basically make it work, but as soon as those headsets will get smaller and smaller to the dimension of the glasses that I'm currently wearing, for example, I think that's when we're gonna see probably mass adoption. Even, you know, using it on the street, walking, for example. It's the first version, right? I mean, over yeah. time, obviously, it's revolutionary in what they've built and how you're able to interact with it, but it's just the first version looks like some, some ski goggles. So I'm sure they'll, they're, they're gonna adapt it and, and make it more cost, like less costly, but also easier to interact with, probably. Not so big on your face, <laughs> I would think. Yeah, to, to answer the question, I'm not a, a, a guru, so I can uh, talk about the macro trends and maybe also uh, very quickly uh, in two words about my life. I was born in the mountains, I love nature, and I don't intend to spend my whole life behind a screen. I but think a lot of people appreciate that and too. Appreciate, and, and, yes, and, and, yeah. we, and we have the opportunity as uh, builders and uh, as a community to create the world that we want to, to live in, so we're not slave of technology and we can do whatever we want. That being said, I think right now we are in a macro trend. I was talking about ambient internet, but more, more generally, if you think about marketing trends, the brands are trying to go more directly to the customer. Uh, if you think about Nike, the strategy that was engaged since 2017 is exactly that. They removed uh, their Amazon stores and they tried to acquire a lot of companies and the, the peak of it was Artifact, but uh, in between you had a lot of data collection management uh, companies and the idea was to be more connected to 
to the customers. And in tech, it's the same. You're tr like all many different capabilities were already compressed in a, in a phone. Now with your phone, you can do uh, anything you want and you have uh, almost no interest. Of, of, I know it's obvious, but to, to have a camera on the side, a clock or whatever. But uh, now it's gonna be even more because maybe we're a bit tired to be in a screen. And as you said, if the device becomes smaller, back when I go in the mountain, maybe I can hear the sound of a bird and directly I can have information about this bird, understanding why it's uh, being extinct, maybe take some action, maybe uh, uh, see that there is uh, some kind of a, you know, a dump dumpster that was uh, being left here so I can take it, maybe it can be connected with a clean to earn tool, I don't know, I just invented it on the way, you know, I take garbage and then I can earn some, uh, some ETH because I clean the nature. So I think, again, we just need to invent the world that we want. And at least this is the philosophy uh, we have in the company. Uh, and we're very, uh, uh, that's what we try to share as a spirit. Um, our opinion is that many people are scared that it replace in a way our physical life. Right? That's what my, my vision is not going to replace, it's going to improve, right? So in, in 10 years, I hope they will still be uh, NFC Lisbon, right? Uh, but Ooh, maybe there will be Ooh. more AR or VR experience, right? Or to give another example, every morning I try to do my uh, 10 minutes of meditation, but I have a stupid app. I mean, the experience is not that great, I'm pretty sure. With a VR headset, it would be much more immersive and I would enjoy probably much more uh, the experience. So it's a tool that can help us, human or brands, to improve some experience, but for sure, I mean, uh, nothing beats real life, right? So we'll still go to restaurant, we will still have a real life uh, interaction, and uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm aware we've gotten pretty deep here. Does anyone have a different perspective on uh, this side of the metaverse before we move on? This, this guy does. Do you wanna come up here? <laughs> Just a quick one. I know we're, we're, we're here for NFTs too. What's up? Yeah, come on up. Just quickly. <laughs> How's it going? What's your name? And then go ahead and, and provide your perspective. Hi, my name is Paul. Um, I'm founder of CEO of a company called Core Team Group. Employs 100, 150 people, specialize in HR technology and finance tech transformation. So I heard some of the use case you guys are talking about at the moment and whether companies are using it. Um, and I don't think, you know, the visual, like the visual stuff you spoke about, about a bird and everything like that. What you guys don't realize is that Ernst & Young, Accenture, these companies, two of the largest companies in the world, are already using the metaverse. Right? If you look at Accenture in the UK, they onboard 100% of their graduates using metaverse technology. If you look at Ernst & Young in France, they use metaverse technology to onboard 100% of the new employees. So I think the use cases we talk about here are things that we may personally want, but when you look at metaverse in a B2B scale rather than a B2C, it hasn't even started. You know, the same solution you said about birds, you can actually use that in onboarding a new employee. What, 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 you know, all of you guys have had a new job. If you've worked for a big company, um, what does it feel like when you turn up to the, door for the, the front door for the first time? Your mental health is just down here, right? But imagine now if you had an AR, VR app, forget the phone, just an, uh, forget the glasses, just an app, a VR app. You walk up to the building, you don't know where to go, you're lost, you're scared, you don't know who to speak to. You pick up the phone, you look through the app and it shows you there's reception, there's a lift. You go into the lift, you press the button, which button to press. You get to your floor, there's 400 people sitting on that floor. You don't know where to sit, you don't know who to talk to, you're nervous. Okay, you look through this app, you can see where you're sitting, who's sitting next to you, who's sitting on the other side, where HR's office is, where the toilet is, where you can buy lunch. So, you know, the, the cases that we need to speak about I think B2C is dead, gaming, there's you know, too much gaming, but when metaverse companies start to look at how we can solve B2B problems, mental health problems, uh, and you touched on learning, I think gamification of learning is a huge thing, but the three aspects that I think metaverses are touching everybody's life at the moment, and they will do very, very quickly, and, and we're not talking 10 years, we're talking two years, is going to be the recruiting, the onboarding, and the learning element. And the whole hire to retire journey of a person, those three elements will be completely transformed by Metaverse, AR, and VR. Appreciate it. Give it up for him. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a great point to look at. That. I mean, it's a very specific use case, but I think it's a great one. And a lot of 
as you mentioned, big companies are starting to, to utilize that in a huge way, you know, onboarding all these people. I'd love to hear your perspective. Yeah. Uh, what I can say, I agree on the B2B. So at Exclusible, we started by uh, selling NFT. So let's say the first year of the business, 100% of the revenues were B2C. And now 100% of the revenue is B2B. And you mentioned the big company like uh, EY. So I had a conversation last month with EY and we'll probably work with them to build some experience. And I asked if they have a lot of demands. They say they have a huge demands. And actually, their biggest client of EY, it's EY itself, because they have office all over the world. And they have so much demand only for them. Uh, so yeah. So they told me they saw a stable demand. On our side, we also saw stable demand. So the demand is different, right? Last year, everyone wanted to buy a land in Sandbox. Then now it's more like they want to build an immersive experience, either in a game or something like spatial or more photorealistic, right? Like uh, Unity or Unreal. Uh, so there's still a demand, but just the demand is a bit different. And now they want more KPI or return, not necessarily return on investment, but now we talk about return of on engagement, right? So they want to compare, example, with, with Hugo Boss, we had 30,000 visits and they check, okay, people stay in average 10 minutes and it's good because they spend more time in this experience than on our website where they stay two, three or four minutes. So we need more and more concrete use case, more and more data, more and more KPI, whereas like a couple of years ago it was more, okay, I need a land and that's it. So actually the market is much more interesting now, right? They want to build real stuff, real use case. Uh, whereas before it was a race to have the first mover advantage to have article in the media to say, okay, this company is getting in the metaverse and after they, they didn't do much. So now actually the, big, the budget are a bit bigger, but I mean, bigger ambition, but uh, yeah, they need to justify this investment by KPI. Yeah, at, at, the, at the first it was, it was hype. Everyone was trying to jump in, invest all this money, you know, spend billions on just trying to figure out what to do in the metaverse and get some land, get some NFTs, and that was that was pretty much it. But now it's like, how do we actually in, interact and engage more with our consumers in different ways, in, in 3D worlds and experiences? So I think that's that's a good point, especially in the B2B side. Yeah, I, I think personally that we reach a point where we are calling every single 3D application on the internet the metaverse. And we need to be mindful that that's not true. Again, it's a part of the metaverse. I don't think these companies are using the metaverse per se to onboard their, uh, you know, their customers, right? I think they are using 3D applications, which are basically part of what the metaverse could potentially become. Like, for example, if you have an educational institution uh, which provides, you know, medical training, then you're going to train to be a surgeon. You can train to be, you know, a <laughs> forklift driver, you know, whatever you want. Like, there are endless applications, right? But, you know, it's unwise to call those a metaverse rather than a 3D application on the metaverse. We have to be, to make the distinction between metaverse platforms and the metaverse and as well between, you know, 3D applications and the metaverse overall. Yeah, definitely. Let's hear from this guy. You want to come on up? What's your name? And then go ahead and ask your question or your perspective. Yeah, my name is Sven from Germany. And um, I want to add that you talked about B2B and B2C, but I think the metaverse is about friendship. It's about community. It's if you have a parcel in a virtual land like crypto voxels, for example, you build your space. You have neighbors. It's like social media 2.0. You can interact with your neighbors. You can, this, this goes so deep, way beyond B2B or B2C. It's C2C. And the business in the metaverse, okay, that's there too. But it's about the users, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I love what you just said. And now we're a 30 people company. But if I can tell the story of why BAM Builders was created, it's a story in CryptoVoxel. And back in uh, 2019 with uh, my brother Adrian, who's here, uh, we, we, bought, we bought a land in CryptoVoxel, like many people, and we wanted to create a brutalist museum, you know, like a big museum with Florentine architecture, but as if it was cast in concrete. We wanted to do this. 
And on the next plot, there was a guy that had a big pixelated cigarette that was turning around like this. So aesthetically, we didn't really like it. So we created a big vegetal wall to hide it. And it was at one in the morning in Europe. And the guy showed up in the building and he said, hi, I'm your neighbor. Can you just put down this wall because it's kind of hiding the view of my big pixelated cigarette? And we said, no, <laughs> we're a museum. We're not gonna put it down, etc." And it ended up in a neighbor fight. And in the end, he, bought, he built an even higher wall, you know. And it's not exactly friendship, but it was a neighbor fight. Yeah, yeah. And that's, if you that's think about it... That's interaction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. If you my neighbor in CryptoVoxels blocked my parcel site, too. Yes. And Brian Armstrong, the CEO of Coinbase, he twittered about it, like metaverse drama. It's, yes. it's, it's great. And, yeah, if and, you, and, and sometimes friendships evolve, because you, you meet your neighbor, you build together, um, be, yeah, we became friends, but yeah. if you have a neighbor fight, it means that each of the party is interested in the space, you know, just like in a yes. physical building. So it means something. Yes. And we said, okay, maybe there is something to be done. And uh, now yeah. the rest is history, but it's a neighbor fight in CryptoVoxel, mm -hmm. so I completely... And you can, you can walk inside, you can see the Voxel Architect guys building in real life. That's, that's wonderful. So another part of the metaverse, in my opinion. Yeah, Thank I, you. I, I agree with both of you guys. Uh, I would say rather than, than friendship or neighbor fights, I would just use one word for this and call it social. The metaverse has to be social. Back when we started to build in CryptoVoxels, the first build that we ever did for someone was a Roman amphitheater where one of the very early communities in the NFT space was hosting a weekly meeting. It was called Token Smart, and they were hosting very early meetings I'm talking about back when Nifty Gateway was not even existing. Like they were talking about that in that Roman amphitheater. We also created the uh, Olympics festivals back when the Olympics were not hosted because of COVID pandemics. We created on a huge 21 parcel lot, uh, one of the biggest metaverse Olympic festivals in there. We managed to crash CryptoVoxels as well, but it was fun as heck, you know? Uh, even the, the founder of CryptoVoxels was there and trying to, you know, trying to put the put CryptoVoxels back online. But the fact that we even did that, that we managed to crush CryptoVoxels, means that people had a shit ton of fun, you know? And, uh, and yeah, that's why the metaverse has to be social, you know? Definitely. Yeah, thank you so much for the question. <laughs> thank you. Give it up. To, to give some figures going in the direction of friendship. If you look at the US market for Roblox as an example, two thirds of the kids between nine and 12 years old are using Roblox. And they're using in average 2.6 hours per day. And yeah, sometimes if you ask two kids for Christmas, you know, you want a real Gucci t-shirt or you want a Gucci t-shirt in the game? And uh, many of them will say, well, for sure the one in the game, what I'm going to do is the real one because their friends are from all over the world in the games, interact with them every day, and it became very cool in the game to have a, a Gucci t-shirt. Yeah, they love it, don't they? <laughs> I mean, the, the fact about um, you know, making this digital world and these, these metaverse spaces more interesting, for, especially for kids now, um, that they have this connection to so much more, and they also can have all this really cool merch and things that they got, you know, Dot Swoosh now has you know, given people all these sneakers, but now you can actually use it in EA games in different places, and, and they love that. They love the ability to move it in different places. So I'm wondering, from this, is NFTs, are NFTs needed for the metaverse? Absolutely not. <laughs> no, they are not needed. <laughs> but they can help tremendously. That's the thing. So by the definition that I give at the start of the metaverse, the metaverse does not depend on NFTs and it does not depend on a blockchain technology, but it can be massively enhanced by it. That's the thing. We don't have to confuse, again, the blockchain, NFTs, because th these topics are always intertwined. Metaverse, NFTs, and blockchain. Why are all those together? Well, because they are revolutionary technologies, all of them, but they can benefit from working with each other. They can be enhanced by each other. They do not depend on it. Um, so you can have, for example, I used to be a gamer, uh, still playing some games right now, and I used to play League of Legends a lot, and I was buying a lot of skins. 
in, in League. So that was, you know, my world, my metaverse back then. Uh, and I was buying these visual skins just, you know, for flexing, basically. It's a, it's a social need to, you know, to have something that others don't. Uh, to feel special because I was spending a lot of time in that game. So what if those were NFTs, right? Because I was not owning them. Like, if League of Legends decided to ban my account tomorrow, I would lose all of them. But if they would sit in a wallet, and if they choose to ban my account tomorrow, I can still sell them in a secondary market. They are mine. I paid for them. So this is a big use case where NFTs can hugely enhance the metaverse and blockchain as well. So yeah, that's my take on this. I love that. Anything to add? I mean, that's that a great point. I think that, let's say, it's a good tool, but I remember when we spoke with uh, Roblox about NFT and blockchain, but the guys said, look, we have 65 million users per day. What? We don't need this, right? Uh, so, however, in, in, let's say, more like decentralized vision of the, of the metaverse, for so example, in this platform called Spatial, where we created 5,000 penthouse, what is interesting is that people, they can decorate their space, right? Their penthouse with their... NFT, right? So you have the living room, the cinema room, the bedroom, and in each room they decorate and they invite their friends. The same way that in real life you invite a friend at home, you say, look, I, bought, I have this photo, I have this painting, I have whatever. And uh, of course with your NFT you can certify that, yes, you're the actual uh, owner of this. So I see it as an interesting tool that go in the direction of interoperability, but I still think that, yeah, most games we prefer to stay in kind of in a closed environment and they will not be really interested in uh, interoperability and NFT integration. On a, on a business side, uh, so on the client side, uh, I think that uh, our clients, they consider NFTs as a very interesting tool to um, create a technical layer around loyalty programs. Uh, right now, when you have a loyalty card, you often forget about it because you, it's boring and it's in, a, even if it's in an, your Apple wallet or whatever, it's, uh, it's very boring. Now, if you create like a, a full roadmap, like very relevant with a lot of activations, a lot of experience, uh, and you pair it with NFT kind of loyalty cards, you create a loyalty program with a value on the secondary market. So from the brand standpoint, at any moment, you have a vision on a certain community that ca you can activate at any moment. You can potentially message them. You can offer them services, uh, even in real world, such as cutting lines. Uh, so it's very interesting and you can uh, uh, have, so it's not necessarily your whole client base, you know, like if, uh, if you're a fashion company, it's not necessarily uh, the typical, uh, for instance, Louis Vuitton customer, but it's a type of customer that you can particularly segment and target. And from the customer standpoint, when you want out, you can sell your uh, loyalty cards. If the brand made a good work, it has a good value on the secondary market. And at any moment, you have a client base that is up to date. And in my opinion, that's what maybe Tiffany is trying to achieve with the NFTs if they continue to deploy the brand long term. Gucci Vault, it's the same. And uh, what we did, for instance, with Carrefour and the uh, NFBs, it's exactly the same. We have a program that will engage. Another good example is uh, Lacoste, the community that Lacoste deployed. It's uh, also uh, interesting. And I think long term, this is the very, use case, a very interesting use case of NFTs. Yeah, so mainly it's uh, adding that extra layer of interaction where you can now track and reward and give people um, thanks for their ownership and their and their journey throughout your, your consumer base or throughout your products. And, and obviously being able to own truly what you're interacting with and what you're using and all that is extremely yes. important, right? Yes, and maybe also, you know, like what emerged with NFTs, I don't know, maybe a lot of you noticed, is that of course the NFT artists were kind of starified but you also had um, the, collect the collectors that became starified. And we saw uh, recently at uh, NFC Lisbon a lot of collectors that did interventions, etc. And now with this layer, the client can also potentially be starified if, he, if the client takes part to user-generated content and uh, engage the community and uh, uh, motivates it. It can be another, uh, another way to recognize the value of uh, what they bring to the table. Please quiet down. Please. I don't know where it's, I think it's back there, but maybe we can get them to quiet down a little bit. Sorry, <laughs> go ahead. Also something else, what is interesting is to bridge the gap between digital and physical, right? So imagine you have 
uh, metaverse experience, and inside this metaverse experience, you have an activation where you claim an NFT. And what do you do with this NFT? Maybe you will be invited at an event, at a fashion week, to watch the tennis at Roland Garros or whatever. Uh, so, yeah, I really like when it makes physical, digital, um, and it can have a value or not, right? Maybe, maybe just a collectible. It doesn't need to have a value. Yeah, it may definitely. Have. Definitely agree. Is there any points in the crowd that we feel like we didn't cover that you really need to get out there? Anything? That's it. Okay, I think, I think we did cover a, a good breadth of, of the topic. Um, you know, we went deep into, you know, is it really useful? Is it, you know, what is the metaverse? Obviously, I had to d define that quite a bit. Um, okay, we got one more, yeah? Do you want to come up for it? Or here. Thank you, Octav here. Um, what about the interoperability between metaverses? Because you have all these different sort of metaverses, but what about, or what are your guys' opinion on their interoperability? I'm gonna take on that question. Interoper interoperability is another term that has been widely used in a lot of discussions, in a lot of panels. What is interoperable? Well, what's the definition of interoperability? Between different metaverses, between different places that you're interacting, I guess. Yeah, well, interoperability actually already exists on the internet, if you guys know that. The internet has been built on open standards, so it means that the internet in itself is interoperable. And if we refer to the metaverse, again, as this definition of this three-dimensional layer added on the top of the 2D layer of the, of the internet, then we could say that the metaverse is interoperable as well because there are hundreds of three-dimensional applications being built on top of the internet right now. So at the core, it's, it's interoperable, right? Now, if you're talking about interoperability between applications, that's extremely difficult because you cannot just take an avatar from the sandbox and move it to Decentraland. They are built on different standards, right? That's why open standards are important. So unless we build every single metaverse application with open standards, we're not gonna have interoperability. And the best example of interoperability, it's the mass adoption of Ready Player Me, for example. Ready Player Me is this platform where you can create your avatar and they provide you with the tools to integrate your avatars in the virtual world that you're creating. So I can go with my Ready Player Me avatar in VR chat. I can go in Mona. I can go in, in many other virtual worlds, right? They support a lot of virtual worlds. So they are contributing to the creation of these of this standards. Uh, but many, unfortunately, are not interoperable at the moment. Yeah, we need to build a lot more. What, quick, yeah. quick one. For, for me, when people talk about in interoperability, many times they talk, okay, going from one place to another, the same way you can go from Lisbon to Paris to London, right? So when we, last time we, we did a party in one, uh, in one metaverse platforms, and you had, so you had a DJ, you had music, and you went on the balcony, and they say, okay, now click there, you want to go to the yacht party, but it was in another metaverse platform, in special, so you click there, and you arrive on a yacht with a new DJ and other people, then you have a jet ski. You click on the jet skis and you go to an island where you have another experience, right? So you go from one place to another, the same way that many of you yesterday, you probably went from uh, one party to another party to another party. So even if technically it's, it's not interoperability, but it's still the ability to go from one place to another by clicking on a link, which is basically what the internet is. Yeah, I think we're gonna move closer to that. So just to wrap up, is the metaverse truly dead? Yes or no? Yeah, okay. There we go. A lot of no's. H how do you feel? <laughs> all right, all right. There we go. <laughs> um, and with that, I want to thank so much to our, to our panelists. Thank you so much, audience, for listening, interacting, engaging. What's, thank you, what's this, what's this point? <laughs> I, I actually, I'm so sorry to cut you off. Could you ask the panelists maybe, or do we have time? Okay. So, in the future, are we all gonna be like uh, living in the metaverse, or are we gonna be like Ready Player One, 
all with VR headphones every day, 24-7. Do you play Roblox? Yes. So you are already in the metaverse, according to my definition. Maybe to complete this answer, um, you can create the world that you want to live in in the future. So it's going to be probably uh, a mix. And if you think about philosophers from the 1500s, maybe you heard about Berkeley, and Berkeley believed at the time that we were all living in simulation and everything we touch is the product of our brain. So maybe it's already the case, we don't know. It's called the simulation hypothesis. If you want to check it out, there is a fascinating article on uh, Wikipedia about it, simulation hypothesis. Yeah, just, just to add to that, uh, I think it's gonna be both. During our lives, we're gonna live in the metaverse, and you know, if we want to continue living in the metaverse, we could uh, even, you know, even after we're not gonna be able to exist anymore. So you see what Elon Musk released with Neuralink, it's this chip that you put in your brain, basically, and you can relieve other people's memories. So maybe you can upload your conscience to the metaverse and live there forever if you want to, you know? So um, it'll be sad to be glitching in a wall forever, but you know, let's, uh, it's our responsibility, mine, Paul, and Tibalt, to make sure that does not happen and we create the best possible metaverse experience. Copy, George. Thank you. I think that's it. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, audience. That's our time.